you all the way live from the lower bottoms of West Oakland. This is Revolution. Today, I am so lucky to have, and I, and I have to tell the story about today and my, my guest today. Um, I was all excited to speak to my guest today a few days ago. And we had uh, a whole thing scheduled. And then the melee jumped off at the Capitol building. And my guest goes, hey, we got to reschedule because I got I to gotta check out this. <laughs> this stuff that's going on at the Capitol building. Uh, today I'm speaking with Mike Davis. He's a social commentator, urban theorist, historian, and political activist, professor, He's best known for his investigations of power and social class in his native Southern California. Cal I would say California in general. Uh, he's the recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship and the Lanin Literary Award. Mr. Mike Davis. You sound like you're announcing me from the ring. Of course. <laughs> You you talk some real stuff, Mr. Davis. You 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 don't pull any punches when you when you talk. So when you write these books, I feel like you're you're uh how do you how do you say it? Um I've never I haven't yelled out right on in reading a book in a quite a while and in reading City of Courts, uh I definitely yelled out right on a few times. Well, I thank you very much. The The truth is that until I was about uh, 40 years old and had my first child, mm -hmm. I thought of my life primarily as a, a movement activist, but I really wasn't good at anything. Uh, I was a poor <laughs> public speaker. Uh, the guys at work, I worked as a teamster for um, a long time would kind of laugh at me, uh, you know, when I venture, you know, some of my radical ideas about, about the union. And um, by the time I was 40 also, I mean, so much of the activism had, had receded. So the mm -hmm. books represent uh, the one thing that I have some skill at, which is uh, writing and research. And literally all of them, have been conceived as kind of an exercise in tool making. That is, <coughs> books that are tools directed toward particularly younger activists uh, across the country. Never particularly had an academic target for any of it. <coughs> Hello? Are you still there? Do we lose you? Uh oh. Hello, Mike. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. I didn't hear you for a second. You're still there. Yeah. Now you. So after you you watched uh, the goings on of was it Wednesday? No, Monday. Yes. Um. What was your first reaction when you see breaking news coming from the Capitol? What was the first thing that went through your mind? Well, I, like almost everyone else, I was astounded by the way the, the passive role of the uh, Capitol Police mm -hmm. after we'd seen the brutality against Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrators. But my second thought was, Wow, we're watching the the splintering of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and for some Republicans, this is a, a liberation because their careers and futures are no longer tied to the the Trump cult. And I think what will uh, see you over the next year is really the emergence of, of two parties, even if they retain the same level of Republican. And one party 
which it would be a mistake to call moderate in any way. Mm-hmm. It would be the post-Trump party that's realigned more closely with the traditional business power structures. <coughs> sorry, of the the Republican Party, and a whole generation of young Turks, primarily in the Senate, the people like uh, Tom Cotton, for instance, from Arkansas, is often mentioned as a presidential candidate. That's frightening. Uh, You know, they'll retain the alliance with Christian conservatism um, and will still be, in fact, a, a far-right party without Trump. Meanwhile, and this, the leadership of this is mainly centered in um, uh, the Senate, and senators, of course, uh, are less prone to uh, being unseated in primaries because of their access to uh, uh, corporate money. So retaliation by Trump is probably going to be, you know, relatively ineffective against many of them. On the other hand, Mm -hmm. the Trump camp has become virtually a third party. And as Mm -hmm. we saw uh, in the the certification vote, we had over uh, 150 Republicans, (coughs) the majority of Republicans in the House, rejecting uh, the results of, of, you know, of the election. And this party, of course, will continue to have a large presence. And the, I mean, you, you, you know, we have to understand that right now, probably all Trump is thinking about is, is vengeance, taking revenge on Democrats who haven't supported his, uh, 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 narrative, and he's in a good position uh, to keep the majority of these seats, at least for a while. Uh, much easier for Trumpites to retaliate uh, against uh, House Democrats than Senate Democrats. So this is quite an epical thing. This is a splintering and realignment uh, of the Republican Party. But must be very careful about celebrating this as the end of the Trump era or the end of uh, the Republicans uh, as a potentially majority party. Uh, I mean, so many of us, myself included, before 2016, thought the Republican Party uh, was dying despite all of its attempts to restrict uh, voting and disenfranchise people. And, of course, quite proven wrong in 2016. Uh, So much depends on organizing on the ground, particularly the priority in the union movement of winning back Trump voters, union Trump voters who had previously voted for Obama, who had been lifelong Mm -hmm. Democrats before. Which were a lot of the people in that crowd. Yeah. Here, here's a question for you, and, and I don't know if you've been asked this already. Do you think Donald Trump succeeded where Bernie Sanders didn't even try? So to your point about the, this, there's a Trump faction of the Republican Party that's breaking off and kind of forming its own third party. There are people that believe, people on the left that believe that Bernie Sanders should not have ran within uh, the Democratic Party, but but probably should have ran as some sort of third party candidate, especially after he lost the nomination. No, I think, I think it was a necessary uh, decision. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a great uh, uh, success The you know, last year's primary uh, campaign. The problem was that eventually all the eggs were put in the electoral basket. Mm. I mean, the strategy of uh, the Sanders campaign is we're repeatedly told, and I think most activists in the campaign believe, was inside, outside, to use uh, popular struggles in the workplace, communities, streets, to to help elect uh, candidates. And then those candidates... 
uh, in turn to support, reinforce uh, the the mass struggles outside of uh, uh, Congress and electoral politics. But as we saw what happened after the Sanders concession in March was in fact the strategy was almost totally electoral. I mean, Bernie constantly was coming out with these great ideas, applauding Mm -hmm. workers who were revolting against unsafe working conditions. But always that was followed by an appeal to contribute to Democratic candidates rather than calling for mass protests. I think one of the greatest failures subjectively was to build a movement in support of the healthcare and other essential workers who were working in con- you know conditions of, of great uh, peril and danger, uh, although groups of Black Lives Matter activists and some DSA chapters and others did support on a local level actions by uh, uh, workers. There was no national campaign, no national coalition. That would have changed, reshaped the nature of the final uh, 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 campaign. Instead, we allowed, in a way, Trump to capture the whole issue <coughs> of, of, of jobs and mm-hmm. uh, economic uh, fears. Supported by, you know, uh, uh, a short-lived but dramatic recovery of jobs uh, during October. Uh, So the absence of of the protests in the streets and support actions for uh, workers in peril had, I think, very grave uh, consequences. And obviously we should continue to support uh progressive caucus uh in congress but the focus now needs to be basically uh non-electoral i i should add to that the fact that of course you know perhaps some of the listeners are thinking well you know hell uh the trump maniacs were out there without you know mass we couldn't do that we had to Mm -hmm. stay home and obey the, the recommendations but in fact, as, as Black Lives Matter protests showed, it was quite possible to have mass protests with everybody wearing uh, masks and to do that safely. There were various predictions that those protests would become super spreader events. And they didn't. Like the Republican uh, yeah. uh, protests were, but in no case did that happen because people uh, observe the necessary precautions. We should never give up the street under any condition. Hmm. I like that. Never give up the street. Um, I've been reading a little bit of uh, Durkheim's concept of anime. Um, was it rulelessness? Uh, the, the, the writer and journalist Chris Hedges uh, speaks about it quite a bit. Um, do you, what is it? Durkheim sees anime as a state of a uh, social disintegration due to a far reaching social change, uh, industrialization, uh, the introduction of the structural principle, division of labor, social differentiations, um, the disappearance of old principles of structure and, and order weakens social cohesion. Um, do you think that has anything to do with what we saw um, at the Capitol building and, and with kind of the rise of figures like Trump? Well, I mean, Durkheim uh, has been uh, reinstated recently through books like Bowling Alone and uh, to read the columns of uh, uh, that deeply wounded conservative David Brooks and you know, he's, always, he's, he's always talking about this, about uh, the decline of, <coughs> you know, uh, associational act, act, activity of, of, you know, 
community activities of uh, uh, workplace-based, uh, you know, friendships and the like. But I think this is grossly understated. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, it hardly applies to the case of African Americans, Chicanos, and immigrant communities. I mean, what we saw in Georgia, for instance, mm -hmm. was an astonishing display of a capacity for self-organization and struggle rooted in the black communities, uh, you know, strong uh, uh, structure of, of, of solidarity and the institutions that support that, like the churches, uh, for instance. And, of course, in the, you know, Latino community, immigrant communities, where you have extended families and all kinds of kinship links going back and forth across international borders. I think that anime uh, uh, hardly applies. Uh, you go out in Trump country, and it's a little different because, sure, there are the mega churches mm -hmm. which have become so important in the grassroots mobilization of, of, of Trump voters. But here you have the case, particularly, I, I talk about this in a recent article, of people who, affluent people, Republicans who moved to the countryside and outer suburbs, and essentially lead these fortress lives uh, in a sense that they're bunkered down in separation and rejection run any kind of common life uh, with the majority of, of other Americans. And, of course, anime creates the conditions, uh, particularly for the growth of uh, conspiracy uh, mm -hmm. theory and wild beliefs of, uh, uh, of different kinds. And and isn't that kind of what we saw too at that that Capitol raid? A bunch of QAnon people, of course, the MAGA supporters, uh, people that believe the election was stolen due to false votes. Um, I, there was an article I forget, maybe it was in Forbes, I forget where it was, about the woman that got shot in the neck who was, voted for Obama twice. Well, she's an interesting case because she comes, she grew up a few miles from where I did in eastern San Diego County. I know exactly that area. Uh, <laughs> I know that area I well. Up, uh, now, a totally forgotten place called Lakeside, uh, called Bostonia, which is midway uh, between the city of El Cajon and uh, the little town of, uh, of Lakeside. And this is an area. Uh, I have black relatives by marriage, and they couldn't come out and uh, visit us when I was uh, growing up. It was simply too dangerous. This area has a long history mm -hmm. of violence and against people of color and uh, uh, immigrants, including probably about a half dozen murders over the last uh, uh, 25 years, and unsurprisingly, it's a hotbed of Trumpism. She seems to, you know, have been different, uh, you know, initially. But the, you know, the, the if you're around other people, the pressure to conform to their beliefs, and you know, just the constant bombardment of these. Uh, uh, claims. And this came from, I think, not only her uh, friends, but from, you know, her family as well. <clears throat> so maybe she wasn't a hopeless case uh, after all. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't kid ourselves about what's happened in this country. Um, you know, Six seven years ago, we we're talking about uh, the one, the one, per, the majority versus the ninety nine percent versus one yes. percent. Yes, 
<coughs> well, <coughs> everything, every poll taken since Trump's election and polls that have come out in the last few days show that there's 35 or 40 <coughs> percent of voters who are absolutely rigidly and unmovably uh, on the far right. And there is a soft Trump vote, like the union members we were talking about, Mm -hmm. who should not be forsaken in any sense. But we have to understand (coughs) that the 40% reality is here and it'll stay here and how how to deal with it. And I think we're probably only beginning to see now uh, right-wing terrorism on a large scale. Now that, now that it has martyrs and now that uh, the Democrats have taken power, uh, the groups who led the charge into, uh, you know, the Capitol, some of them are just inept, you know, they're a bunch of brutal <laughs> fools. Mm-hmm. But others aren't. I agree. <laughs> but I think we'll see more uh, Timothy McVeigh's. I, I agree. I agree. I, I, I kind of see that coming. And that was the one thing which was interesting when I heard. Well, I, I saw a lot of the comments on social media where people were kind of upset that there wasn't uh, the Capitol Police taking shots at these people and and this and the other. And two factors I looked at it. I was like, well, first of all, these are the same people that were on the side of the police during the Kenosha protests when the cops shot uh, that young man in the back seven times. Um, and, and well, number- I mean, one of the, uh, the stories mm-hmm. in the news media today is how many different cities uh, there are investigations ongoing as to members of their police forces yeah. participated uh, in these events. It was a large number. There were a lot of cops. <laughs> yeah, this was the Blue Lives Matter crowd out there. Excuse me? I said this was the Blue Lives Matter crowd that was out there for the for the most part. Yeah. But cops themselves, I mean... Uh, I come from a large working class family, and one of my uh, favorite grand nephews mm-hmm. is a uh, county sheriff in Washington, the state of Washington. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is a guy who uh, always had great kind of, not progressive, but liberal, tolerant values. Mm-hmm. And just seeing uh, the culture of policing. Uh, uh, changes those values. I mean, we all know, we've all ran into good cops yeah, at one time or another, but the police are an unchangeably reactionary and racist institution, even when people of color, minorities, make up uh, a large proportion of the police as in the instance of many of the, uh, uh, you know, the Capitol Police. <coughs> so this makes it so imperative and important for all of us to renew our commitment to Black Lives Matter, but at the same time recognize that the target needs to be considerably widened to include not only the uh, the cops, but the whole criminal justice and penal system, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as well. I mean, this is in some ways the, the most successful movement I've seen since um, the nineteen uh, the 1960s. And although, you know, many of us would call for other coalitions and and building other movements uh, uh, as I pointed out earlier in the show about the need for a coalition to support essential workers 
It's all important to continue the fight <coughs> against uh, uh, the criminal justice system and uh, police violence. So do you think uh, an organization like Black Lives Matter, I shouldn't say, I mean, they're kind of not autonomous, but do you think movements like that can work with law enforcement to change law enforcement or no? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, requires considerable uh, explanation and education of what we're talking uh, Mm -hmm. about, but. (laughs) <laughs> we shouldn't be on the defensive. Black Lives Matter had an enormous uh, impact. My wife, who works in the community colleges here in San Diego, mm-hmm. <laughs> wrote a uh, resolution for her, her union, the AFT, for eliminating the, the campus police. Mm-hmm. That overwhelming support. Uh, and this includes a lot of people who uh, uh, you would expect not to, uh, you know, embrace such an idea. But the experiences of the last, you know, several years have had a deep, uh, a deep impact. And that's why we need to challenge centrists and establish Democrats who say, oh, this is killing us in the elections. Uh, this is a crazy demand. No, it's a reasonable and absolutely necessary demand to defund the police and refigure uh, public safety uh, in new and democratic ways. <laughs> I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, uh, for, for those that will be listening to the show for the, for the first time, um, I've worked with the uh, with the unhoused at one of the proper uh, operation room key shelters here in Oakland, California. And if, if anyone knows anything about that, um, to, to get into the shelters, you had to be a part of a, a pretty high risk population in being homeless. So it wasn't just like they snatched up the first 10,000 homeless people they saw. You had to have either severe mental illness, chronic homelessness, like a, a diabetes or, or HIV. <coughs> so generally, you're dealing with a pretty hard to deal with segment of the population. And we weren't we didn't have a lot of resources for people. They pretty much just took the streets and threw you in a hotel and said, deal with it. And there were definitely situations where people had weapons um, and things got violent and law enforcement would have to be be called. And you'd never want law enforcement to come to certain situations because you know how sometimes they can overreact. So when you call an, uh, an officer because you have a person that you can't, you've done everything that you have been trained to do, everything you humanly possibly can do. But you're like, look, this person has a knife or a gun and they're they're mentally ill, but I don't need the cops to come in here and, and put them down with a weapon. Um, so I totally understand the need to change the way we look at law enforcement, especially when it comes to, uh, uh, getting calls for people that are dealing with, uh, mental illness. But we face, um, a dilemma, uh, that was so almost insuperable during the, the 1960s. Mm-hmm. And that generalized police violence, particularly when it takes on, is on a strategic form, mm-hmm. uh, that is part of a deliberate attempt to destroy movement organizations like the COINTEL program targeted mm-hmm. by the Tea Party in the 1960s. You end up focusing everything on self defense and on, on the police. And there's the danger of, of, of losing attention on the main targets, on the ruling <coughs> institutions. Mm-hmm. 1960s in L.A., uh, that was an old guard uh, power structure, savings and loans and uh, the family that owned the, uh, the Los Angeles Times uh, banks and so on. 
And they essentially got a pass from protests because everyone was so uh, deeply immersed in trying to preserve lives and movement groups from, uh, you know, police attacks. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out how to deal with this situation where repression, even under Biden, is Mm -hmm. probably increasing. And we have to, you know, defend ourselves. We have to, you know, respond in the same heroic way BLM has to uh, uh, to the police murders. But we need at the same time to try and figure out how we can keep publicity and activism also targeted uh, on the actual ruling, ruling groups, whether that's, you know, the, the small city uh, business elites or whether on a national level, you know, we're dealing with things like private equity in, in, in hedge funds. So this is really a question of how simultaneously to give an anti-capitalist direction to the necessary struggles of the next year. And this is where I wanted to uh, read part of your, your recent uh, essay that I got in the... Uh in the uh um in sidecar uh tomorrow liberal pundits may reassure us that the republicans have committed suicide that the age of trump is over and that democrats are on the verge of reclaiming hegemony similar declarations of course were made during vicious republican primaries in 2015. they seemed very convincing at the time But an open civil war amongst Republicans may only provide short term advantages to Democrats whose own divisions have been rubbed raw by Biden's refusal to share power with progressives. Freed from Trump's electronic fatwas, moreover, some of the younger Republican senators may prove to be much more formidable competitors for the white college educated suburban vote than centrist Democrats realize. In any event, The only future that we can reliably foresee, a continuation of extreme socioeconomic turbulence, renders political crystal balls useless. I love that because on the show a few days ago, we were talking about the uh, the relationship now between neoconservatives, uh, the Lincoln Project Republicans and the and the neoliberals in the democratic party and how they seem to be working together um maybe better than ever <laughs> to well, really influence the progressives if you saw the uh Folsom uh love note that uh, Biden issued uh to McConnell <laughs> you realize how completely captive he is to this idea of restoring bipartisanship and, you know, in Congress and finding a working relationship uh, with the Lincoln Project type uh, Republicans. But I think this is a profound and, and dangerous illusion. And right now, what's happening is not so much that the Romneyites, the Lincoln Project people, are regaining control of the Republican Party as younger far-right Republicans uh, who've broken with Trump are in a strong position uh, not to restore, you know, Nixonian or even Reaganite republicanism, but to preserve the uh, the far right revolution, but on a basis uh, that makes it more appealing, not only in suburbs, but some of these guys, and they're almost all guys, <laughs> um, you know, have different positions on immigration. 
and mm-hmm. undoubtedly are are cheered by the success of Trump uh, in November uh, amongst evangelical, uh, uh, you know, Latinos. So it remains to be seen how this, you know, sorts itself out. But the Republican Party is, uh, you know, is undergoing a metamorphosis, not a uh, 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 disintegration. But the problem is that, you know, the Trump base, the hardcore Trump base, the 40 percent of voters uh, that we've been talking about, uh, is unlikely to move very uh, far. I did a kind of back of the envelope calculation about the election and about the 72 or 74 million Trump voters. And if you take this 40% figure, calculate that as a percentage of uh, the Trump vote, you're still left with about 17 or 18 million voters who are critical of Trump but voted for him for some other reason. I think most likely fears about shutdowns and jobs and the general uh, state of the economy. And these are people that uh, could be recruited to uh, the the Republican Party that's represented in, in the Senate. There might be one one back, particularly in blue-collar cases, to the Democratic Party, depending on how active unions are and organizing campaigns are in in the next period. But you're left still with what's basically (coughs) a powerful uh, neo-fascist minority in uh, in this country which is important to understand better, but, I mean, everything of uh, the last four years uh, shows us that, you know, that Trump was right about his infamous statement that he could go shoot somebody in the streets of New York and and get away with his supporters at all. Well, in a way, he shot hundreds of thousands of people in this handling of uh, COVID. He's driven... Oh. Uh, the country into uh, uh, to recession, but everything you know the polls the last week and show that that segment uh, of his support hasn't changed, and this becomes, I think, will define a new age of uh, political violence in this country. So. Are you familiar with the work of Andres Malm? He wrote the book uh, Corona, Climate, and Chronic Emergency. Yes, yes. I I can't – I'm familiar with with the work on a very super <coughs> superficial level. Um, the, the, he, he writes a, a – a, a book that I, I I didn't see too many people talk about it, and probably because a lot of it has to do with he wrote it. It came out during Corona. You couldn't do book tours around it and all that other stuff. Um, but definitely kind of explains the fact that this is where we are in the world, that these things are going to be a lot more common. And you have been talking about this for a long time. Uh, zoonotic. Uh, viruses and their relationship to to us and 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 our reluctance to really deal with it and it being one of the bigger failures of capitalism i would say well the the current healthcare system in this country and the international public health uh, institutions <clears throat> are really incapable <coughs> of translating what is an absolutely historic uh, revolution in 
biodesign, biotechnology, uh, genetics into public health for the majority of, 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 of people. A lot of ink will be spilled on how all this happened because the Trump administration dismantled the pandemic surveillance and response infrastructure that had been built, built up by the Bush and Obama administrations. But it goes so much further than that. Mm -hmm. If you look back at the history of campaigns against infectious disease, there are two different templates, two different camps. The dominant camp in this country and, 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 and globally are militarized campaigns against specific pathogens or their carriers, their uh, vectors, you know, mosquitoes and so on. Uh, this model was originated in the U.S. Army's famous campaigns against uh, yellow fever. After the, uh, <coughs> after the Spanish-American War and during the building of the Panama Canal, the Rockefeller Institution hired many of these doctors and specialists. And from the end of the First World War down to the end of the Second World War was the major actor on a global scale uh, in campaigns against epidemic uh, a disease. And the Rockefeller model uh, persists uh, uh, today. A good example of this was the Obama administration's uh, campaign against Ebola in West, Western Africa, which included sending several thousand American uh, uh, troops. But there's another tradition, the tradition of social medicine, uh, whose origin lies with some German doctors who were activists, revolutionaries in 1848. Rudolf Virchow, considered the father of pathology, was one of those revolutionaries. And his concept of social medicine was that you can go around kind of endlessly trying to combat, you know, one pathogen or another. But the key thing is to build an infrastructure of primary medical care and public health uh, uh, on an encompassing scale. And to do that, <coughs> you need to bring about uh, basic reforms, uh, agrarian reform, uh, weight raising income and, and wages and so on. And that model deeply influenced the, uh, the, the classical socialist movement and uh, then the communist world. It was the Soviet Union who actually uh, conceived the idea of a campaign against smallpox, but also married it to this concept of increasing health capacity through radical reform, particularly in poor countries. And the high point was in 1978 or 79, when the World Health Organization conference in Alma-Ata and Kazakhstan uh, adopted a declaration <coughs> now forgotten, <coughs> which uh, declared that uh, health was a basic fundamental human uh, right and should be the goal of the World Health Organization and the policies of, uh, of all countries. So you have to ask yourself, well, we're going to have the vaccine eventually. Uh, and there may be big problems with it if, if coronavirus continues to mutate. But even in the rich countries, particularly in the United States, and in the case of uh, Tory Britain, you know, 
we're still working with the you know the wreckage of healthcare, public healthcare, uh, left by a generation of of, of, of cutbacks. For instance, sixty thousand public health workers, people who work in county public health agencies and the like, lost their jobs after two thousand and eight. Those jobs had never been, uh, you know, refilled. So in the country that spends almost twice as much as other rich countries on medical care, uh, we're working with a situation where uh, a quarter of the population can expect only the most basic or or primitive uh, care, which expresses itself... Of course, in the disproportionate mortality uh, amongst African Americans, yes. Latinos, but on a world scale, yeah, even if two years from now the the vaccine finally uh, uh, is available in you know small farming communities in in Africa and other poor parts of the world, the fundamental structural problem uh, remains, and that's the absence of access to uh, reliable, uh, uh, you know, health care for hundreds of millions of of human beings. Now, a final point about this is that the social medicine idea was actually probably developed most sophisticated way amongst the Latin American uh, starting in the 1920s and 30s. And one of its greatest greatest advocates, and he wrote several books about it, was Chile's <coughs> Minister of Health during the uh, short-lived Popular Front government in 1938 and 1939. Mm-hmm. Uh, this doctor's name was Salvador Allende. Who and later became president. In, 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 in health. Mm-hmm. Uh, although largely unknown uh, uh, to most of us, were absolutely fundamental uh, in his life and uh, in the Chilean Socialist Party. Um, I I found an interview of you from a few months ago uh, in Mother Jones, and you have a really interesting quote. Uh, you said it's a bit like the 1918 Spanish flu combined with the Great Depression. This is in reference to to the pandemic. Uh, I mean, Americans went to bed uh, one night in early March and woke up the next day to find out they were living in 1933. The difference, of course, is that policy has played a far greater role in this case than it did in 1918, even with the Great Depression. Hoover actually was extremely energetic in dealing with soaring unemployment after the stock market crash. What he did wasn't sufficient, but he was a famous engineer and a famous administrator of relief. So there's no comparison between Trump and Hoover. Trump has become the principal vector of coronavirus in this country, one might say even in the world, because of the way that others like Bolsonaro and Brazil, Duterte and the Philippines followed his example. Well, I mean, it might have been possible up to the the end of April to attribute the disasters of our coronavirus response to the sheer ineptitude (coughs) of the Trump administration. But beginning with the thuggish movement, Mm -hmm. he launched against uh, state governments and public health agencies the you know remember liberate wisconsin liberate oh, uh, michigan yes. it turned into an active war against uh public interventions against the uh disease <coughs> this is a criminal conspiracy by any uh definition which is why it's so important that there is a full-scale, serious uh, investigation 
of the conduct of the coronavirus campaign and the sabotage the uh, administration. This is what progressives in Congress need to fight for. And if Congress can't do it, then it needs to be done by some kind of uh, citizens commission uh, drawing together uh, experts from communities and experts on labor uh, safety conditions with epidemiologists and so on. And it should indict people. If it was done in Congress, that would have some real power behind it. But even the Citizens Committee should keep in front of us the criminal liability of the Trump administration and also <coughs> of <coughs> private sector medicine, the corrupt mm -hmm. uh, private equity firms that dominate the long-term uh, 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 care industry. This is incomparably more serious than the attack on the, uh, the Capitol. I agree. Other crimes that Trump has been accused of, but I fear that the Biden administration will, will give it a pass in the same way that Obama gave a pass uh, to Bush's uh, war crimes. Certainly there'll be uh, commissions and investigations and talk about that investigate what, what went wrong and what we should do different. But all of them most likely will avoid this question of, of, of guilt of liability, uh, of the criminal aspect of, of, of all of this. Do you think, so here we are in the middle of a pandemic where we have tens of millions of American citizens that just don't have health care um, in Lancaster early in the year. And I don't know why this story, you know, still isn't resonating with people. There was a young man that uh, didn't have the right insurance left and, and he was in good health. I think he was like 17, uh, left the hospital, died on his way to the emergency room to the county hospital of coronavirus. Well, the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, what we're seeing and sometimes confusing with the, the pandemic is the result of 40 years or more since the inauguration of uh, Ronald Reagan, <coughs> 40 years of downsizing of neglect of public health, uh, putting hospital and medical insurance prof profits ahead of everything else. Mm -hmm. And there's no better example of that than uh, USC County General Hospital in Los Angeles, the major uh, uh, public hospital. It's been overwhelmed for decades. Uh, I have friends who work there as nurses and doctors, and the conditions have been appalling. Uh, seemingly from the beginning of time mm -hmm. because the county will either not raise the taxes or doesn't uh, have the capacity to adequately fund it. And it's the shock absorber along with the jail system. As the jail sy system functions as a system of mental health incarceration, the public hospitals <coughs> are the last resort of uh, low-wage working uh, 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 people and people who now express surprise that the system is collapsing. The ICU capacity in Southern California is exactly zero right now. In other words, they're totally overwhelmed. They're conducting uh, you know, very frightening triage procedures where people who look to be really mortally ill uh, 
ambulance crews have been told not to bring him into hospitals. Yeah, that people, that's people who doctors seem probably be on saving or being disconnected uh, from their respiratory apparatus to make way uh, 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 for others. I mean, the full horror of this rests on a basis of a privatized and greedy private health care system and a public health care system uh, that in so many ways has been uh, run into the ground. Of course, something very similar has occurred in Great Britain. I lived in uh, Northern Ireland and London for most of the 1980s. <coughs> And as someone who never had health care before, it was just amazing uh, to have this quality free medicine to pay almost nothing for prescriptions and so on. But the flagship of the British, of the accomplishments of the British labor movement, the National Health Service, had been run into the ground by several decades of Tory privatizations and downsizing. You see clearly. Uh, uh, you know, the results from this. So there's a great danger of just focusing on the immediate crisis and ignoring the structural crisis, uh, which is the context in, uh, in which this is uh, uh, happening. So Medicare for all, single-payer, National health insurance is more urgent than than ever. I, it was a, a shock to me, as I'm sure it was to many of your listeners, when negotiators to the Sanders camp at the end of March, or maybe it was early April, uh, accepted and made a concession to the Biden camp of uh, his version of Obamacare with a, uh, a public option, which is a, 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 you know, a failed and, and, you know, totally inadequate response. We have to make sure that there continues to be a national struggle over this. I mean, every poll has shown that overwhelmingly the majority of people, including many Trump supporters, understand and and demand uh, Medicare for all. Uh, the danger is that uh, the cause of so-called democratic unity will marginalize it as with the rest of the uh, agenda advanced by Sanders and by uh, Elizabeth Warren. But we need to fight this also, uh, particularly on a on a local level. <coughs> One of the tragic effects of the way the pandemic has been managed is that so many smaller hospitals are going bankrupt uh, or closing down. Fiscal austerity dictates the uh, continuing reduction of public sector jobs, including in, uh, in, in public health. So rather than energetically rebuilding primary uh, and emergency care, uh, we're continuing to, uh, uh, to downsize it and to dismantle it, leaving us more vulnerable than ever. Uh, to the next pandemic, whether that's avian flu or something uh, uh, totally unsuspected like uh, the coronavirus is. And, and that's another failure of, uh, of the system that we that we're in currently, because uh, wasn't there a lot of research that was being done during the Bush Jr. administration about uh, finding a vaccine for some of these, uh, these uh, zoonotic uh, diseases? Well, the problem is uh, that there are some very important vaccines. <clears throat> there was a vaccine developed for SARS, for instance, 
<coughs> the coronavirus mm -hmm. relative of, uh, of our, you know, our current virus. But big pharma makes it so often made it impossible to produce these vaccines on, on scale or even, can, you know, create stocks of candidate vaccines that have already been tested. Because the very nature of big pharma, it sells itself as the industry which guarantees our, our health, that develops new drugs and treatments. But in fact, uh, the larger part of the budget, a larger part of the budget of uh, the big pharmaceutical firms goes to advertising. Uh, not, not research and development. Not, you know, not to research. The industry focuses on the highest profit uh, medicines, uh, medicines for heart disease or diabetes or for the sexual dysfunction of elderly males like uh, uh, me. Uh, <laughs> I've had health problems in recent years. And after an operation, develop one of these uh, antibiotic-resistant hospital infections, bacterial infections that, that nearly killed me. Uh, about 30,000 people a year die from these. The whole antibiotic revolution is being rolled back for the lack of, of, of research uh, uh, and expenditure to develop new generation antibiotics and, of course, uh, antivirals. What Big Pharma does uh, is it buys up research which often was developed first in public universities mm -hmm. and licensed to uh, smaller pharmaceutical or biotech companies, often run by faculty members uh, of those universities. It buys that up, sometimes not for the purpose of, of using the research to develop new products, but to prevent those products from coming on the market because they compete with the far more expensive uh, uh, existing uh, jobs. In other words, the big farm industry are essentially rentiers, okay, who use uh, uh, patents to extract huge profits but have abdicated uh, the, f the fundamental research was the basis of their, uh, you know, legitimacy. So big farm, in a sense, uh, is a major part of uh, 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 the problem. They only really do these things and their profits are guaranteed, like the billions of dollars have been thrown in the big pharmaceutical country, companies by the Trump administration. And if you look at something like the Moderna vaccine, mm -hmm. well, so much of this is research that, again, came out of public uh, universities, it's backed up by a billion dollar federal investment, yet taxpayers get no return from the sales of these vaccines. The company keeps all the products of all the profits of a product that was developed so largely uh, by tax dollars and, and the public sector. That's an outrageous situation. And we're also seeing, I don't, I don't know if there are, I don't know how recent this article was. It was in a Canadian publication that South Africa isn't getting any of the Moderna vaccine um, that they sold a bunch to Canada and a bunch to the European Union and a bunch to the United States. And uh, South Africa, who's where there's like a hundred, where a million coronavirus cases, I forget how many deaths South Africa has had, but they're the most in the African, uh, in Africa. Uh, and they're not getting any any help whatsoever from from uh, Moderna. Not even I was shouldn't say help. They're not even able to purchase anything from Moderna. Well, I mean, well, on one level, in terms of uh, medical research, uh, we've seen an astonishing. Uh, common sharing of, of, of data 
Mm -hmm. and, and collaboration between researchers and medical workers across the world, led first of all by the fact that Chinese researchers uh, have exploited their huge database on uh, coronavirus and shared it uh, with others, which has sped up the development of vaccines. So, you, you know, you have this example of a, of a scientific public uh, commons, just as it should be. But in everything else, ruled by pure nationalism. Now, the European countries have agreed to contribute a small amount of money to make uh, vaccines available in poorer countries, sometimes only on a symbolic scale. Mm -hmm. But the United States has tried to corner the world market uh, in vaccines uh, at the expense of other countries and uh, particularly poor countries. It's been widely estimated in the medical press that it may be at least two years before poor countries uh, began to have vaccines available. And the situation in, in Africa as a whole uh, is really out of control. The first wave, the spring-summer wave, uh, was less horrendous than I think most people expected. But right now it's turned into a conflagration on a continent where uh, malnutrition, the absence of sanitation and, and clean water make so many people uh, uh, immune-suppressed and vulnerable uh, uh, to the pandemic. The World Health Organization, which is supposed to be the lead agency in international response, of course, it's been marginalized, partially because it's been hollowed out over the years by the failure of countries to make the contributions that they're signatory to. So leaving the World Health Organization dependent on alliances with a few major countries uh, big pharma and some private philanthropies like the, the Gates Foundation. So essentially, on global level, the whole effort is disintegrated into you know each man running for its lifeboats. The exception is that the Chinese are beginning to distribute you know large quantities of their vaccine. The Russians also. Uh, to some extent, but the American case is simply the most uh, the most terrible and the most uh, uh, criminal. Now, I've argued for a long time that we're well. The prospects for an American left uh, have never been stronger. There's a very great danger in the left of inversing our own radical version of America firstism. I think there's unmistakably been a decline in, in internationalism. Uh, and the place to begin with all this is fighting for uh, aid to poor countries and renewing the principles of the Alma Ata uh, uh, Declaration on healthcare as a universal uh, human right. And and I look at the Cuban doctors that have done uh, such a great job globally. You know, sending those doctors all over the world to uh, to help. Uh, it was it Italy they went to and and really got the numbers down there and. Um, they were the only people to take on that uh, ship um, that had a, a ship full of people that had uh, COVID on it. So, and 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 I think didn't they even uh, ask to come to the states, and and we wouldn't let them come come in. Well, you know the Cubans, the Cubans are always heroic in these circumstances, and punching far above their. Uh, wait, 
What happened in Italy was that although the European Union leaves health care to the individual nations, it has a protocol, a treaty <coughs> that requires countries to send uh, aid and, and support to other countries in the event of natural disasters, including pandemics. Italy, last uh, uh, late March or April, invoked that protocol. And the response was that the French closed the borders and forbade the export of any French uh, uh, medicines or, or, or resources, likewise with Germany and other countries. In other words, the, the EU totally collapsed into, uh, you know, nationalism mm -hmm. on this question. And the only relief that came, the only aid that came, was the Chinese sent several plane loads of uh, medicines and experts. But above all, uh, the Cubans, I think that probably the <coughs> least known story of all this <coughs> is the case of Andorra. Andorra is this basically a valley in the, in, in the Pyrenees that's socially independent and kind of jointly ruled by Spain and uh, in France. It developed uh, as particularly because uh, Spanish construction workers in Andorra, uh, it developed, you know, uh, a huge outbreak in this tiny place of coronavirus. The French would not aid Andorra. The Spanish would not aid Andorra. But the Cubans immediately sent 20 doctors to, uh, to Andorra. Wherever there is a major outbreak, or epidemic uh, crisis, the Cubans are always there. And we should also recall that in the Western Hemisphere, uh, it's Cuba, not Brazil or Mexico, which has the most innovative and advanced medical research uh, in Latin America, third only to uh, the United States uh, uh, in Canada, uh, Cubans have made astonishing breakthroughs in designing new treatments and uh, vaccines through diseases, particularly uh, 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 tropical diseases. Uh, should have been a Cuban doctor on the front page of uh, Time magazine's uh, person of the year. Well, it looks like zoonotic uh, diseases are going to be stuck with us for some time. Uh, they're not going to go away once we get a vaccine. And um, do you feel like Americans were kind of waiting for Superman, if you will, when it came to the vaccine and not really taking heed to any? And, and a lot of this has to do with, with the federal level, um, social distancing and masking. Well, again, because of the absence of a powerful solidarity movement with essential workers and, and, and healthcare workers and the very weak response of the Democrats, people simply have not been educated, first of all, about the underlying structural conditions of, of underfunding and disinvestment in healthcare, the role of big pharma nor about the nature of the new relationship between uh, human societies and animal viruses. In my old book, Monster at the Door, written in 2005, about the threat of avian flu, I cite a study, which I consider to be the absolutely remarkable <coughs> example of... <clears throat> how these new diseases emerge. And in a nutshell, it looked at the case of urban West Africa. West Africa is the most rapidly urbanizing and also the youngest uh, area uh, on earth. Traditionally, West Africans, urban West Africans uh, consume protein largely in the form of fish. It's, 
30, 35 years ago, the big factory fleets from Western Europe and Japan moved into the Gulf of Guinea. And the researchers estimate they simply vacuumed up half of the fish mass uh, in the Gulf of Guinea. Not to put fish and chips on the table of wealthier countries, but most of it was used simply to feed was feedstock uh, for poultry. Uh, uh, so prices of, of fish soared. Uh, several million local fishermen lost their jobs or found themselves bankrupt. At the same time, multinational logging companies clear-cutting the great tropical rainforests in <clears throat> uh, Cameroons, Gabon, to reduce labor costs, they began hiring hunters <coughs> to feed their logging crews. Uh, and the hunters basically killed anything that was potentially edible, from snakes to, uh, 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 to monkeys. Because of the <coughs> uh, food crisis, particularly in the, the, the slums of urban West Africa, they also began to sell to people in the cities, and this became a major part of uh, of the diet in the cities. So here you have two very large scale uh, profit driven industries exploiting natural resources, and in the case of logging, breaking down the barriers, the uh, kind of protective belt or defenses between human communities, and huge reservoirs of animal uh, uh, viruses. The growth of slums created enormous vulnerable populations lacking uh, sanitation and so on. I mean, these are the conditions under which uh, Ebola evolved and spread, and likely HIV mm -hmm. as well. So the preservation of, of tropical forests, uh, massive aid to family agriculture, uh, so that poor farmers uh, uh, don't essentially uh, uh, cut and burn in, in, in forest areas. These are essential steps that need to, to be taken. I mean, capitalism mines the planet uh, in a comprehensive uh, 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 sense and is responsible uh, in large part <coughs> for the increasing prevalence of diseases which in viruses and in some cases bacteria and fungus that jump from animals and plants uh, 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 to humans and of course as um, uh, Rob Wallace has pointed out so brilliantly in his book on factory farming. Factory farms are the ultimate incubators and accelerators, like particle accelerators of disease emergence. You know, when you have 100,000 pigs on a single hog farm or millions of, of, of chickens in giant uh, 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 factory setups, uh, you could not think of a more diabolical uh, situation for the, the kind of genetic transfers and infections that accelerate the evolution of pathogenic uh, viruses in, in new diseases. I mean, some people, you know, some of us have a, uh, a problem of describing everything in the world to... Uh, to capitalism, but in the case of disease emergence on almost every level, it's the for-profit sector, the corporate uh, sector, that is directly indicted in what has become a new age of pandemics. And we're not that far away from the next uh, pandemic. Right now, yeah. there's a bird pandemic going on globally leading to the culling of millions and millions of birds. Ten European countries, East Asia, 
uh, many parts uh, of Africa. And the pathogenic uh, subtypes in, involved in the death of birds pass from wild birds to domestic birds and, uh, you know, vice versa. Include, for instance, H5N1, uh, which is what my book was about and in, in which, the you know, I've been the chief worry and chief candidate uh, f uh, for a pandemic for the last uh, 20 years. That threat has not diminished in any way. An avian flu pandemic, which should be far more deadly than coronavirus, is not a matter of if, but uh, when. Uh, lots of researchers, researchers would use the term imminent. Do you think, because I feel like Americans are still split on the severity of coronavirus, and a lot of that has to do with, and I don't want to get too much into it with, you know, again, the administration's kind of mishandling and downplaying of it early on, but 300, almost, we're almost at 400,000 uh, people that aren't here with us anymore because of coronavirus. Um do you think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there hasn't been the like like AIDS? I remember when Rock Hudson passed away, and how that really made people realize that AIDS was real, and it wasn't relegated to a certain subset of society. Um, has there been that moment for COVID yet? Well, I think for majority of people, uh, uh, yes. But the kind of denialism uh, that ignores the vaccine, that encourages not wearing masks, mm -hmm. uh, that believes that the Democrats are running a child pornography ring out of an Italian restaurant in uh, yeah. a Washington suburb, uh, that thinks that Antifa actually were, were the ones who, who trashed the, you know, the Capitol. I mean, this is a, you know, these kinds of uh, uh, delusions are, in fact, a, you know, a form of uh, a, a fatal disease. Uh, nobody knows what the real cure for that is, except for the fact that all all this has been incubated and spread within closed media environments uh, dominated by right wing radio and and. Fox News, and now Fox's far-right uh, uh, successors. So the decline of independent journalism and smaller daily newspapers in the country and the establishment of this informational monopoly over so much of rural and small-town America uh, is an essential part of, uh, of, of all this. Uh, I mean... My wife and my youngest son are constantly showing, because you know they're on their cell phones or the computer all the time. Constantly showing me, you know, absolutely uh, bizarre rumors and factoids uh, that are rapidly uh, 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 circulating, and we have to recognize that we really haven't created a, a, a popular culture of science in in this country. I mean, you end up with the fact that the guy who owns the Creation Science Museum here in eastern San Diego County uh, is a biochemist, or that there's so many uh, uh, doctors and healthcare workers who buy into uh, uh, parts of these theories who who won't take a uh, a virus or believe that coronavirus was a chemical we biochemical weapon developed uh, in a Chinese laboratory yeah I, I saw which is which is frightening um very frightening um well I've taken up I feel like I've taken up too much of your time as it is because you you only had so much time and I appreciate you going over with us. Um, I appreciate all the work that you've done and continue to do. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, is there anything you want to say before we, we end the episode? 
No, it's simply that it's uh, it's it's been an honor to uh, speak to your audience, uh, and that Oakland and the East Bay, uh, you know, remain one of the really thrilling and and important centers of activism in this country. And thanks to your show and uh, so many other things. I'm sure that will con- con- continue. So all power to the East Bay. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Don't hang up. I'm going to play some music. Don't hang up.